select board meeting for Monday, July 19th, 2021. Um, first order of business is to approve the agenda. And I've already been told that we need to, we're just gonna omit the consider appointment of delegate to CV Fiber because we have multiple candidates now and we'll do that at the next meeting. Okay. So item B on consent agenda is scratched. Um, and then there is one candidate that was mentioned that has withdrawn. So the second interviewer will not be in, being interviewed. So um, unless there's any other changes, I will take the motion to approve the agenda. Actually, I take that back. There's no public, oh, there is public, I'm, never mind. <laughs> is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items, minutes from the July 6th meeting and special event permit for Waterbury Arts Fest, number 10th and 11th, which I need to recuse myself from. So Chris, if you want to take over on consent agenda items. Consent agenda items consist of the minutes of the July 6th meeting, consider appointment of delegate and CV fiber. No, that was Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. On special event permit for Waterbury Arts Festival, September 10th and 11th. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? We discussed that Waterbury Arts Festival. I didn't know if that would have to be a consent agenda item. Well, well, you didn't get the vote. Well, yeah. we didn't, I know we didn't get the vote. So it's on the consent agenda, which means if you make a motion to approve the consent agenda, we don't have the minutes and, the, and that get approved without discussion. Yep. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Second. Thanks. Any further comments, questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Pass it back. Yep. Um, so now we are on the public portion of the meeting. We've allotted only two minutes. I'm not sure if there's anyone from the public that wishes to speak tonight. Um, this is an opportunity to speak to anything that's not on the agenda, which really other than the interviewing, um, we don't have anything else besides the private racial equity training. So is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak before we move on to our interviews for the school board? All right. Um, Glenn, is it okay if we start a couple minutes early since you're yeah, ready? Absolutely. Okay, great. So as everyone knows, we had a um, school board member who has decided to leave their position. So the process, and Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the school board actually selects the candidate for Waterbury. It is not a select board um, appointed position for the placement, but we do have the opportunity to interview and make a recommendation as a board. Um, there was a specific time, so all candidates needed to notify us or the, or the school board by Sunday night that they were interested in the replacement in the position. The position has to be filled by their timing on that. I think the school board is going to vote on Wednesday night. Okay, so meeting. we expect Wednesday night for the school board to vote on a replacement. Right. Um, everything else you said right. is accurate. It is okay. a school board appointment. They, they are encouraged to seek input from the select board of the community for the where the vacancy has occurred. Uh, this provision, I think, is going to sunset in 2022, and I'm hopeful that when it does, that the legislature will see fit to allow us select boards in towns in unified districts. The point is because it does seem a little odd that you let school board members from other communities decide who's going to be our appointees, but that's what it is right now. Okay. So um, the school board will take the select board um, opinion if you have one in consideration. We don't have to. And introduce and tell the school board, well, choose who you want, we don't care. But they they have indicated that they will be interested in your opinions, but they're not going to be on time. Okay. All right. So everyone who's interviewing, we're gonna try to hold you to 10 minutes um, just so we can move through everyone. Um, Glenn, 
I know we're a minute behind, so we'll, we'll make sure you get that extra minute. Um, but if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, you are on Zoom, correct? Yep. I am, yeah. I'm a little under the weather today, so I um, apologize. I couldn't be there in person. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll try to do this through Zoom. Uh, so I'm Glenn Anderson. I live here on Sweet Road. I've been here 30 years. I think I know most of you um, in different capacities over the years. I've met you or um, interfaced with the select board. Most recently, um, I think it was in uh, relation to the opt-in for the retail cannabis here in Waterbury. Um, I weighed in on some thoughts there. You know, I've lived here 30 years. I've uh, pretty much spent the first decade not um, necessarily having an opinion. You know, I felt that and this is kind of relevant now too, with so many people moving into this community. You know, I felt there was a period of acclimation necessary before I came in heavy handed with a thought of, you know, this or that. And it's not, in my opinion, xenophobic to ask people to uh, get a sense of what this community is about uh, before weighing in with big ideas. Um, and in many respects, one of the other candidates, um, you know, on tonight's list, Scott, uh, we've had chats over the years about this. So, you know, from my vantage point, I read the uh, opening for this position and I just got the impression that nobody really wanted to be in on this. Um, so this, it was a surprise to me when I saw there was other candidates and, and you know, it's very, I'm thankful for this because uh, I just have a lot on my plate lately. So, you know, for me, this was an idea of, of stepping up because it felt like there was a vacuum at a time when we really need service uh, on this board to represent Waterbury. Um, in Waterbury Center too, right? Two zip codes, uh, which I think relates to what uh, Bill was just saying, you know, as far as uh, different districts and different select boards or, um, uh, you know, portions of this uh, uh, unified district, if you will, are um, making decisions about assets that happen in different communities. And I think that's gonna be um, one of the most important pieces to think about as a community as we move forward into the next uh, iteration of what uh, this school system's about. Uh, let's see. I mean, I've been the trail adopter here on um, you know Mount Hunger and the Skyline Trail uh, for you know, since '94. Um, you know, I'm the uh, founder and current uh, head of the Worcester Range Collective, where we have a presence on Facebook. If anybody wants to check us out, and you know, that's been my activities to date. It's always been quiet in the background. I haven't been somebody that's looked to serve in an elected capacity. I haven't really, um, you know, necessarily had a lot of time to. I've been pursuing business and other ventures in my life, but, you know, at this junction, it just felt like uh, something that needed to be addressed. So I'm glad to see there's multiple candidates. Um, you know, I'm definitely interested to hear what these other candidates have to um, bring to the table and then consider whether, you know, I am the best for it or if maybe somebody else is best for this position. You know, I do think that, uh, it's something that there's a lot of traditional voices in this community that I think are getting uh, increasingly displaced. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, as those of us that have come new, and I'm 30 years deep in this community, so there's still a sense of um, obligation to make sure that we push this forward while giving our children the best, right? Um, so uh, things that I've done around here, I've chaired the marketing committee for the Green Mountain Club helped to bring those guys over 10,000. I think I shared that with the uh, uh, school board. You know, we did a, a whole extensive thing for their 100th anniversary. Green Mountain Club uh, was just one facet of, of local engagement uh, for me, but I've worked internationally on various projects. I shared with the school board that I've been in 125 different countries. My work and research has been interpreted in seven different languages. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I definitely have been on an international stage. I have a lot of uh, expertise and information architecture, budgeting, digital transactions of legacy data and all sorts of technical pieces that is the STEM or maybe STEAM now of uh, modern education. But that's not necessarily what I think is critical for us to move forward here um, in Waterbury. I think what's more important uh, as we move forward is looking at you know, how do we look at this vision for what is education in these communities. Um, the Mad River Valley, Waterbury, Duxbury, there's, there's a mountain right between us, right? And there's a lot of buildings all over this, these communities. Um, this unified district is interesting because so much vibrant culture, uh, engagement, interdependence has happened uh, with both the Valley and Waterbury and Duxbury. But in many respects, there's still 
division as everybody sees. So I think what I want to try to accomplish, um, you know, and I could list credits and I could give you guys a CV of things that I've done, you know, originally, you know, I'm in a position that I can offer something, but I don't want to come across as pretentious and suggest I have all the answers. Uh, you know, and that's something that having been incubated by uh, Microsoft and, and in some of these other spaces, I always found the insight, not necessarily from the things that I would project on it or the hypotheses that I would have, but it's from listening to people. And I think, you know, if I were to look at three things that I'd like to try to accomplish on the school board, if in fact, uh, I don't necessarily pull out of this um, uh, in the event of, uh, you know, the board deciding that, you know, this was the right fit for the position, I'd want to look at three ways. Um, one, I want to understand what are the impacts of these assets moving forward. So these school buildings are all being built in different ways. Um, and we're arguing over which middle schools are going where and who's uh, sending their kids to what school campus. I think more importantly uh, and critically is that we think about what are the implications of putting tens of millions of dollars into different communities. So I'm not opposed to growth. Um, I'm just saying we need to look at where our enrollment is putting the most impacts on. And we have to be honest about what we're really doing to build up infrastructure for those communities. Like for instance, our, our, our neighbors in Duxbury are having a hard time. We know uh, many of the financial obligations they're under right now. Bringing an asset into this community for them helps stimulate growth locally. Uh, sure, the Harwood Unified School District is great where it's at, um, but if we are really truly thinking about the long haul, we can't just double down to one location and expect that's not gonna just benefit one community as far as prop property valuations. So that's a really critical consideration for me um, because it comes with things like displacing long-time residents. And that, you know, I feel as a newcomer, even 30 years ago has uh, been one of the negative pieces that I wanna try to make sure we don't continue that sort of mindset that we uh, make improvements, that we increase the education front of our children, but that we don't blindly do it by saying, you know, everybody needs to go to college and tech schools are not relevant, right? You know, everybody knows a welder that's making 70 bucks an hour and filling their time beautifully, but we don't celebrate that enough, right? So for me, building community first through the school system is so much more important than basically sending people out as a recruitment vehicle for the college and secondary education system. Though, you know, I went to EVM and it benefited me to, to many degrees. I think we can also um, heal this community through you know, looking at things differently. And, you know, I have friends that are former staff at CrossFit and, you know, many of the things that I hear um, and Harwood as well, but many of the things I hear are there's two types of communities that, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks in the middle that go to school at Harwood, the kids. And then you have folks on one extreme that are bored as all can be. And then you have folks on the other extreme that need a whole lot of attention. We can get that balance right if we rethink things. And it's not always about uh, what necessarily has been dogmatically instilled in us is how we structure schools. I've gone to private schools. I went to a Quaker school for high school. I've gone to public schools. Uh, I understand a lot of the dynamics that come from both of those scenarios. Um, and I, I understand the importance of building enrollment uh, here in Waterbury uh, and stimulating schools for the future of our community. So I don't want to necessarily shut it down, but I do want to you know, get people thinking that instead of just blindly going for one approach that we really think about this whole community uh, wisely. So that was one piece. The other piece, I think, is that we have right now this triangular triumvirate of school board, um, teachers union, and, you know, we, with the superintendent. And I think that's a slightly dysfunctional scenario. And I think we see this repetitively um, in how we're um, hearing of news and different pieces that come through. I'm just thinking recently of the board town bus that um, you know, kind of went off the road. So there's a lot of things where then the superintendent gets attacked for not closing down a school. There's just all this hostility. And, you know, I think if we were to maybe look at it as a square and add a point of interest, which is the actual parents and the public and the residents in this community, um, we can get a little bit further. You know, I don't want to necessarily think that the select board itself should come in top heavy and have all these answers. Um, that's coming from a research mindset. I always pulse people and I want to see what will actually work, not necessarily what I want to see work. And the last piece, I think, you know, we really need to be um, honest about what happens next, right? So there's going to be a big bond vote at some point. I don't necessarily think this position, let's just say it was me, let's say it's any one of the other kids. I don't think that person um, 
nor at this moment in time should be the person or the, the, the board that's passing any kind of major spending package until this position is over. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Sorry, yeah, uh, we're, um, Carla was just letting me know if the 10 minutes was, was getting close. I was just trying to give All you right, a heads well, up. Cool, yeah. I'm pretty much done. I mean, the, the three points that I just wanted to get at were, you know, effectively that was, you know, we need to create more input from parents and the community, not just that triumvirate. We need to essentially look at this position really is a placeholder for whether that position's reelected um, by the people of Waterbury. Uh, then that person is, I think, entitled to, to have an opinion about this bond. Um, I just think it's far too premature. So I'm going to be upfront. I'm going to say this to the school board as well. I don't think it means that it doesn't happen or that it will fail. I just think we need to do it differently. Um, so those are really my main points. I'll let it roll and I appreciate the time. Thank you guys. Thanks, Glenn. A um, couple minutes for questions. Any select members have questions for Glenn? I'll start. Uh, Glenn, the biggest question I have, and I'll probably have the same question for all the applicants. I know I'm a fiscal conservative, and sometimes uh, we look at, you know, I believe in, I believe strongly in education. I believe strongly in the, you know, reading, writing, and, you know, the fund fundamentals. Sometimes, you know, it's really good that we could offer our kids stuff, but the community is being very stretched. Uh, economically, give me your thoughts. Can you give me your thoughts on you know how you would do take that onto the school board with you know the high cost of education in our community? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I I, I look at it from this vantage point. I've, I've um, been here long enough that I see those impacts on property taxes, and and you know I done, I just honestly feel like we're as Waterbury in this union. Um, representing a huge burden, right? So we know that probably 70 to 80% of Waterbury residents through surveys and other data value the, the Worcester range and the undeveloped nature of it. You know, that's a source of property taxes though with the potential of development, right? Um, if in fact a school board, I mean, a school bond passes and we have this huge expansion, that's bed base to help fund that and make it sustainable. Is that the right choice though? So I look at it and say, well, we can expand stuff, but we need to also uh, levers to make sure that things like property taxes don't explode. We need to make sure that those choices aren't putting us in a worse position as well as far as things like, um, you know, the Worcesters, which I care about. And I think a lot of people in this community do. So I think if we can figure out ways to say, well, let's protect upper elevations, let's, you know, look for places where we can grow, which is all part of that planning process and zoning. Um, but at the same point, we're not necessarily acknowledging the impacts that increasing our school will have. And that'll just create division and fights down the road. So I just look at it and say, how do we really plan and forecast for what those spending uh, choices will do? And if we're truly measuring the costs, then that will be inclusive. Uh, to your point, I don't think we're truly measuring the costs yet appropriately. Thank you. Hi, Glenn. Katie here. Um, one of my questions is, how are you with group work slash committee work? Um, are you really dedicated to finding out all the answers? And do you volunteer for a lot of uh, work? And are you in this for the long term? Because we've had two candidates not fulfill their term in the last couple of years. So I personally would like someone who's dedicated to understanding the process through the work and actually contributing their opinion um, and being heard. So what's your take? I appreciate it. Thank you. I think ultimately, um, you know, I work great in groups. Um, I like to think that I have done performance evaluation uh, in 70 different cities around the world. Um, and for these headhunters out of Boston, uh, it's a marketing and, and creative firm. I did that for a while, a couple of decades, well, for a decade and a half. Um, part of that process in working with teams and getting that feedback is, you know, I'm seeing all this data of, of teamwork and how people are, you know, what are the successful pieces? So I was able to profile for, our, for my client at the time. Um, how do you, you know, what is the successful dynamic for a group 
uh, to get things done. And so I've seen a lot of that. And I think I could bring that to the equation. I think I've led some things with like at the Green Mountain Club, you know, we, we did some really fantastic work. Uh, you know, it was for two, three years, I was in, uh, probably two years that I was involved with those guys. And I think that's the kind of, um, you know, I almost feel like I don't want to give up these volunteer positions when they end, but sometimes life just pulls you. I don't really want to get into this for just a year. Um, I mean, just for a month, but if it was at least a year to get us through a period, you know, that I can do. Um, there may be things in the future that, uh, you know, it may just make sense to stay on the team, but I tend to do the work. I tend to a lot of the work, you know, um, and the homework so that I make sure that I'm not drop ball for the rest of the group. Just so we have enough time for everyone else, is there anyone that has any other questions? If they're quick, otherwise, I think we need to move on. I do have a quick, I'll try to make it look fun to answer. Um, Glenn, it's Danny here, and I appreciate so much of what you had to say about the community, the residents' input, um, and particularly the economic impact. But I didn't hear much by way of um, at the students and the, the kids in the schools. So I'm curious your interest, your um, passion, your dedication, what what about this position um, in terms of the actual students interests you? That's really great. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. You know, that was one thing that I forgot. You know, I glossed over the fact that I have three kids in here. And it's not that I just was afraid of leading with that a little bit too much, that it was going to be all warm and fuzzy. I have kids, you know, I want to serve them. Um, we need smart, professional people, not necessarily um, someone that looks like me, right? It just people that will be committed to our community, that care about things. Uh, you know, my daughter's on the rec committee right now, or on the, um, the recreation department as a camp counselor. Uh, I think it's important to instill uh, work values in our kids um, and serving our community. So I'll try to keep it brief, but you know, I've definitely done a lot of volunteer work. I try not to take on too much that I'm not, you know, so that I'm, I'm not on multiple boards so that I can just have a resume. I wanna be involved in something I'm passionate about um, and make sure things get done. And then when I can't be a service, I'll step down. Um, but that's kind of where I'm coming at, coming at from. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, I want to make sure we have enough time for everyone else. Thank you for your time. If you want to stick around, just in case we have any questions towards the end, that would be great. Definitely. You mind if I put you on mute and do the block out on the video? Yeah, that's fine. Yep, All right. No thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your patience. Uh, next up is Victoria. And how do you say your last name? Caravella. Great. Thank and you. I'm Victoria. Okay. If you want to come up here, you have to speak a little out because this little thing yeah, will like spin around. Here? Yeah, okay. here is fine. Okay. That's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and we have questions for Okay, so my name is Victoria Caravella. I go by Tori. Um, I recently moved here. I'm going on my third year in Vermont with my partner. He grew up here. I grew up in Florida. Um, winter has not frozen me out. <laughs> I fully enjoy it. Uh, we landed in Waterbury about a year ago, and I uh, got my roots down, settled, ready to jump into the community. Um, that being said, I know I haven't been here a long time. I am a newcomer. Um, but I think that brings some assets to, you know, I can bring a different perspective. I, you know, am really, really wonderful at listening. I enjoy hearing everybody's input on everything. And then adding my own little insight on, you know, I have substitute taught at schools in Florida and I have helped out at schools in Mississippi. My friends are teachers and administrators throughout the nation. So I constantly hear about the struggles that they face and the innovations and ideas that they bring to their tables, which I think could be an asset in this position that I could bring. Um, I, <laughs> I always, I know you had a question about group work. I hate when you're in a group and you suddenly see that small quiet person getting totally ignored. Uh, <laughs> so that is one thing I make a point of is making sure that everybody is heard because sometimes people have an amazing idea and they're just, a little nervous. So I like to make sure that things are heard and considered properly. And that being said, I know that I know that um, students around here, everybody's very concerned that you lost a lot of education time in COVID. And with all the teachers working and doing dual school plans, they 
they're exhausted. They don't want to do summer programs, but some of the, some of the parents and even some of the students are like, well, shoot, now we're behind. Like, what do we do? Um, I think one of the important things to do would be to see how much the teachers can contribute but not try to push them. And then also work with parents to see what can be done. I mean, I know when I was growing up, we were all sent home not to work books over the summer. Like, here, complete this, and we'll give you little quizzes at the beginning to make sure your parent didn't do all this in the summer. Um, which could be could be something to be considered. Um, I I really I really love this community and I want to get involved and I thought this was a good way to start. Um, as far as my background, I could probably be the exact opposite of Um I am an attorney and I work in Burlington. Um, as part of going to law school, you learn to think of, well, what's the worst thing that could happen with that decision? Uh, and brainstorm ideas on how to avoid that. So that is another thing I could bring to the table. Um, I am open to questions if we want to start that, or I can keep going on about my background. It's totally up to you guys. That's fine. Um, any good questions? I'm, I'm Tori, I'm, I'm Mike. Uh, <laughs> glad to meet you. Uh, following up on my initial question, I um, I, you, 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 you <laughs> come from two states that are very conservative in nature, Florida yeah. and Mississippi. Uh, how do you relate to how they treat education funding compared to how we treat education funding. How would you look at it on our school board? Right. So I will be the first to admit watching Mississippi's lack of education funding is slightly worrisome, to say the least. Um, I come from the southeast part of Florida, so the coast, and it is generally much That's less conservative, yeah, than the rest of the state. So that's kind of my background in seeing that. Um, but I do know you are concerned about the rising cost of it. And I know a lot of people are. And I, I will admit, I don't know enough on where those costs are going. And I think that'd be a good place to start. You know, if it's going towards building and repairs, we have a lot of contractors that live in this area. You know, how could they help us out with those costs? I know I'm sourcing it from the parent community. And going along with that, you know, just going towards through the lunch costs. You know, a lot of kids depend on a school to provide food to them. Um, how could we source it from farms if we're not already? Could be an idea. Um, you know, and technology books, I, I feel like the library is a hugely underutilized resource. And maybe we could loop them in and help us out with the cost somehow too. Like I said, I don't know where those costs are going right now, but that could definitely be, or it would be one of my first questions of, Let's look into that and see what can be done to figure this out and not drive up costs much more in the future. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, how about I'm Dan. I'm Dan. I'm from Fort Lauderdale originally. So we we'll too. What? <laughs> um, I'm curious if you had a chance to um, look at any of the videos of past school board meetings from the district or read any of the minutes and kind of get a little bit up to date on some of what's yeah, going on. Yeah, so I read some of the minutes. Um, I know one of the more recent ones was, you know, the Fly the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter flag, um, which is <coughs> a very large area of controversy. Um, I did enjoy that they tabled it, you know, it's like, hey, maybe this isn't the right time right now, but we're going to table this and we're not totally shooting down this idea. Um, that being said, I think you know, I don't want to start with education costs, but um, it's amazing how many new authors have come into the light, or even old authors that have come into the light of minority authors and ones that just haven't been looked at anymore. Um, and I think it'd be really cool to have the opportunity to sub some of that material in instead of some of the more traditional, probably controversial, like Hudson. Um, Sawyer ones that I mean you could find the perspective of that but in a better more learning more racially sensitive way too. Yeah. 
kind of a similar question to Danny. Mm -hmm. Basically, what have you heard? Because in our high school, we have some infrastructure problems and updating the building that needed a lot of repair. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about consolidating middle schools. And if we're talking about cutting costs, it's usually the extra programs like sports or the clubs that come first. So like, mm -hmm. do you have any like background with dealing with, besides being a lawyer, mm -hmm. like, difficult <laughs> situations <laughs> and how you would work together with other different towns that are dealing with problems of their own, like specifically facing doesn't want to get rid of their school. So having a lot of different issues come at you at once, how do you delegate that and how do you deal with that? Right. Um, sometimes, uh, so I, when I, I know it's, it's going to help. Uh, we did a lot of meetings and I think it's fine with our done until here, which is frustrating, but also nice this is a chance I get. Um, but one of the things I did in law school is I did head one of our fundraising committees. And it involved, and I was one of the representatives for our class, and it involved a lot of weighing everybody else's opinions and viewpoints in it and trying to trying to reach an agreement with them. And I totally understand they do not want to get rid of their school. Bus and kids take a lot of time and resources, and they feel like they're losing that. But small class sizes to the point where you have five kids in a class isn't really the most conducive thing either towards education, you know, and we have limited resources on teachers too. So if we could gather them and kind of bundle the resources better, I think we could explain it to hopefully address some concerns that they have that um, maybe would be helpful. And then, so that would, you know, hopefully help Jason a little bit, but it would take a lot more time. Um, and as far as like the infrastructure with the school, we have that's a hard one. Um, I I I did not get an opportunity to watch that video. Um, I did when I was living in Florida at one point work for the participant contract section in that county, and so I have learned how to kind of assess the bids of, you know, let's go low as cost option, but also look at who's actually qualified to do this work um, and get it out to the community, which could be an option that hasn't already been considered, but I imagine it has, um, it's a, you know, to start that process of this is the work that needs to be done and who can come in a lot of, you know, also who's like trusted and qualified uh, to be in a way to approach that. And, Keep the budget in mind. Um, yeah. Hi, my name's Chris. <clears throat> um, I want to start by saying, when you're introducing yourself, saying that you just moved here and you know that you're a newcomer, or whatever. Um, I don't want you to feel out of place because of that. Um, you know, I've been ridiculed by some people for uh, touting at times that. You know, I'm a native Vermonter, and there's a certain mindset that comes with that. But um, to me, a Vermonter isn't being a Vermonter isn't necessarily that you were born here. It's what's in here and what's in here that makes the difference. Um, and I know there's a lot of people that call themselves Vermonters that I would not because they're just bad people. Um, so other than that, um, I appreciate you stepping up. Um, some of the things that you've talked about are <laughs> very good issues. Um, I think our school system is broken. It's been broken for a long time. Um, when I left school at 17, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. Um, I made a career in the industrial arts and in construction and been a contractor for 40 years. Some of your ideas um, <clears throat> I appreciate, you know, about lowest bidder and this that, but unfortunately, our government has <clears throat> set forth guidelines that pretty much shackle. Um, communities to certain protocol when it comes to commercial projects, um, certain guidelines, certain rules, certain, and, and a lot of it is 
what's costing us way more to build these structures than we really could do them for. Um, I know because we've been through battles like this in the municipal building, fire stations, other infrastructure that, um, <clears throat> quite honestly, people like me just shake my head at, you know, at the outrageous cost. Part of it is orchestrated by these groups as well, because when it comes to taxpayer dollars, it's a free fall. Um, anybody's position on the school board from Waterbury is faced with some pretty heavy headwinds from people in the other five communities, some communities worse than others, where in, from what I understand, um, it doesn't matter what it costs to educate our kids, they'll, they want to pay it no matter what. Uh, even though it's driving other people in other communities out of their homes. Um, if you watch the tax rates in, in the last number of years, education is always a huge part of the increase. Municipalities like Waterbury, <coughs> for instance, I, I'm assuming you guys went with a 52% tax rate here. Oh, we did. 51. No, 52. 52. Yeah. Okay. So that's down from what we had proposed uh, earlier in the year, not knowing uh, our revenue sources and whatnot. We were proposing 53. We went to 52, and one of the big reasons was to help offset the increase in education. That's a never-ending battle. Um, and you know, just, just I wanted to make a couple comments to go on. Yeah, on, uh, so I appreciate your comments. Um, Whoever does get elected to that position is, is going to have their hands full. Thank you, sir. Um, and thank you for your comments. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, I do want to say um, I tried to describe to my dad why Vermont, and I said it's one of the two places that I got in my junior year, and I felt like home. So <laughs> uh, I understand your mindset. Um, and thank you for giving me an insight on some of those challenges and procedures that you guys face. Uh, and one of the things I, yes, I did the whole traditional education out of hospital and stuff, um, but my younger brother was one of the high school done out. Please don't do that anymore school. Uh, so, so I've seen both sides and I, I, do, I do agree with what Glenn is saying also is there needs to be some kind of input and value placed on technical schooling also because we're losing so many kids you know there's that quote you can't judge a fish by their ability to climb a tree some kids just aren't cut out for book they don't want to do book learning and traditional learning but they would be amazing carpenters and metal workers and everything yeah and i do i do think part of it needs to shift a little bit Okay. Well, I think we need to move on. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And please stick around and see if yeah. we have any other questions. Scott, come on up. Hey, everybody. How are you? Doing? So, introduction. My name is Scott Calver. Like Glenn, the oldest in year 30. Gator, I've been here 50. <laughs> I've had Four, four, I have four full grown adult boys who've all made it through the school system. They've all played sports. They all did extracurricular. They've all two gone to college, two work in the school system now. My wife was a, was a uh, sec admin secretary at the Crossfield Mill School for 15 years. She just uh, finished up her tenure there and now she's going to go on and move out and start her own business. So it was like, you know, perfect time. Um, I, I'm working very closely inside of this with, with, with the town. But I was the town with the school board and then having conversations with many of the board members that are already there. Um, I did run last last uh, election and I missed it by a handful of votes and I was pretty disappointed. But I was also even more disappointed when I found out this disappointment or this suggestion of a candidate for this group is uh, only until the next town meeting because I was looking in for the full two and a half to get this thing rolling and make something happen. So I'll have to go back and do a re the rebid and this time around after the rebid is completed. Um, my background, I have uh, 30 and a half years of agency verification as an occupational health and safety manager. 
Um, it means not only did I go out there and teach employees on how to run fault protection, working over water, um, equipment, CDL, you name it, we did. I also was the guy in the ditch with the shovel. I was also the guy in the plow shop in the middle of the night making sure that was safe and things that we do. Um, in the community, I've been a 32 year employee at Billings Mobile, part time, and this is part time except for the job hours a week, so it's really not part time. Matter of fact, nobody even knew that I actually worked for the state because they always thought I was at the store helping me there. Um, like I said, as well, I'm very, very excited about this whole thing. I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done real well. Um, I call the Billings Mobile my uh, coffee shop. I have many conversations on many levels and many backgrounds with many people. And it's, Pretty interesting to feel like a liaison to the group to be able to bring them to another group. And I think that's what we need here between our, you know, our, our Waterbury Town Select Board as well as the Howard Unified School District is to have some more of those coffee time talks to see what the community members are really thinking. And if you can wiggle under the fence and you can get some of that information, you can bring it back and you can bring it back in a positive fashion. That's where we're going to get things completed. Um, budgets, we all talk about budgets right now with COVID. It's like, you know, I, um, I work for Englewood Construction now. I've been there for three years. I also do occupational health and safety there. And I'm helping manage a $30 million building renovation in uh, Dartmouth right now. And I'm just befuddled about costs, rising costs of uh, materials. So to give you a perfect example, a three-quarter sheet of uh, fire-rated CDX plywood was $50 a sheet when we ordered it. It was $157 a sheet when we got it. So what do you think costs like that do to our types of budgets when we're talking 20, 30, 40 million, we're trying to couple in education, books, staffing, retirements. I mean, it's just those line items have really got to be defined to decide on how we're going to do this. We need to move, move forward in the financial portion as well as thinking of the kids and you know the process first and see what we can do to make things better. Um, like I said, with this with the COVID and everything going on, I think everybody's been strapped. Um, there's a lot of people that aren't working, a lot of people who will continue to not work, and uh, you know, a lot of the need that goes on in the community right now, especially with the food programs that had happened, you know, is these are the things that we need to concentrate on and, and move forward. But I think being that liaison between the communities, being able to sit down and have these tabletop discussions, be able to take the line items on the budget and find everything down and figure out where we can make some cuts and costs and some changes to better our education program as well as meet the taxpayers' needs. I think we're gonna have a lot more uh, a lot more community support and a lot more understanding on how to cross the system down. So that's you know with this we want to keep my introduction. Great questions. I'll kind of go with where, where, <laughs> where I'm going. Um, I'll, I'll I'll address it maybe a little bit different way because you address some of the issues that I did have. How do you feel you, if you would advise the school board on controlling costs, you know, directly? Number one, I'd have to understand how where the costs are, how the costs are, are brought to the table, where they come from, um, what what's coming by federal money, what's coming in by account money, who's who's putting who's who's got the most skin in the game in that's the problem. And then we need to understand the dynamics. What do we plan on? Because budgets aren't just one year at a time, and that's how we do. Mm -hmm. Budgets are two to five, maybe ten, depending on what we're doing. If we're going to put together a building, we're going to add on and expand on the cost of the middle school, like we we're discussing. This not this isn't going to be a one-year venture where you're going to put seven million dollars in. Because I remember when they built Cross the Brook Middle School, they had eighty percent federal funding. They could have turned around and built an entire wing for an elementary school over there. When they put that school into fruition, they only paid twenty percent of the cost. Instead, we put. We had a bond for $7 million for Waterbury Elementary School that wanted to be in $12.7 million. Okay, and we move forward with that. So now we're back in the same same situation again, which also contributes to the higher cost in you know the way life is. I mean, inflation is, is moving a lot faster than what people's you know rate of pay is. So we've really got to think about that. And you think about the senior citizens who live here. I'm a fourth generation Waterbury resident. You know, I own two properties and I look at my tax bill and I go. Two jobs, two. I mean, I, I understand we all do it. We all have to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we have the new ones, you know, the new people that want to come in who want to make an impact in the community who better hope they have a really big checkbook or a really good job because they're not going to fit in. You know, it's not, they're not going to be able to make it in this community. So we're, we're really taxed everybody at the same time on lots of levels. And then we go ask them for 40 million bucks. Mm -hmm. 
And then we say, well, this is what we want to do. This is what we're going to do. I just, I don't know how it's all going to shape together. And I think that's more like a discussion for a board, as well as the other school board members coming to their respective town boards and saying, hey guys, what are we doing? What are we thinking about? What's, what, what, do you, what do you want to see come out of this? Based in, I think that's a perfect place to have that conversation with their liaisons to the school board is with their select, just like we should have them here, just like they should have them in the And then see what happens from there, because there's a lot of dynamics. We're talking about busing, we're going to talk about the amount of time the children will spend on these buses. You know, and then it all breaks into dollars and cents. And like Katie said, then you start cutting field hockey and cross and soccer. And then you want to put four million dollars into a track and field like they're discussing because they want to hold events. Where's the money going to come from? It just keeps going. And we don't have any accountability on what we could have cut out of that or what we could have done two years prior or you know, or plan for five years ahead to make these types of things happen. I love this community. I've been here my entire life. I don't plan on ever moving. I bought a second home. Because I want my grandson, my two year old grandson, mind you, to live in this town. And that's where he is, it's a quarter mile from my house. So it's one of those things where I'm, I'm invested. I've been invested for 50 years. You know, I've, 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 I'm a small town guy, I do small town stuff, but I've also got enough experience behind my back in the construction trade with both the state of Vermont as well as Engelbert Construction. And I've got enough community assets back and forth between my coffee pops at the store as well as. Community members and Howard Unified School Districts from district members from other towns who are already bouncing things off with me every single day. So to me, it's just going to be slide in and let's get to work. And hopefully, I can I can make a good impact with everybody with that basis from you know from that small end of the table to March and then have another opportunity to uh, to go to to be re reelected for another one or two year term. So that's where that answer your question. Answered it very well. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just clarify what Scott said. Whoever gets appointed serves until March of 2022, and then the seat will be a two year term. Let me fill the two year term. Through vote. 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 Right. And then there's also one year for me to get next year to the state and then on. Okay. So she decides to do that. <laughs> Other uh, questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so outside of budget concerns, which is such a huge part of it, um, what are some of the concerns or main topics that you've heard from folks that you talk about that you've talked with and or that you have as well? In terms of everybody's always, always, everybody will always ask me, what's this going to cost? That's what the biggest concern that everybody has. And, and in some ways, it's a great thing because they're thinking inside of that budget area, like they're you know, using their own checkbook to pay their bills. But on the other side of it, there it's it's a little concerning at the same time because there are I think that we really have to do you know bind together and push ahead to try to get done to make it better for everybody else. Um we you know we we've talked a lot about the uh the, the swapping of the seventh and eighth grade to the middle school, um, how the K through five program runs, um, after school programs, meal plans. Um, like I said, my wife, my wife worked there for 12 and a half years right in the front office. To the whole entire town of Waterbury, she's Miss Donna, and everybody had, you know, had her ear, and then I would have it when she got home, and I would share some of those concerns with some of the board members that are current on, on the setup now. So it's there's a, there's a whole a whole gamut of things, and I think the biggest one is to make sure that we give our community the best education we can, as well as consider it and making sure that the other the other towns in this unified school district are also in good faith doing the same things with their own. Like I said, I mean, I don't, I don't really know how they break down how that thirty million dollar pie is split up between the number of towns, or how their tax rates are based. I, I don't know any of that. And I think that's because we get, we get the information, and it's just line item after line item after line item, and it just drives you crazy because you know that one item, that one line item has seven subparts to it. So what are the other seven subparts? And if you don't use it in that line item, where does the money go? Could we have used it to keep those sporting groups going? Could we have used it to um, better the education of our students by notebooks and you know the um, this ACLC is in the, regular, school? in the regular budget or the bond? Well, I, the, the bond the bond to me is 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 the same thing. It's a humongous list of line items, and you're not quite sure how things are. I don't know if the checks and balances are in place, and I've never really dug in that deep to look. You know, but that's shame on me for doing so as well. Shame on anybody else who's never looked at it. But yeah, so did I answer? <laughs> I just want to make sure I answered your question. 
Yeah, I mean, if that was your, I was just curious if there were other um, concerns or passions of yours, but you talked about like more plan. And, um, oh, yeah, like I said, yeah, in, yeah. You know, like I said there's, a, there's a lot of things out there that really need, need some fine tuning. There are things that there's some great programs out there that need more funding, need better programs, you know, just like I said, it's a matter of how, how are we going to take that, that pot of money and how are we going to distribute it throughout every program, every, every uh, basis or infrastructure. Um, New, you know, new concepts. How are we gonna, how are we gonna drive all that in, and then everybody's gonna buy into it at the same time. So it's, a, it's a poker game. You know, it's who's, you know, who's the better conqueror to put it, put money into those pots to be able to, uh, to move forward with it. Right. Any other questions? I know Bill sent me a message saying that try to wrap up by six forty-five. Um, I know what I thought about. I don't know that I've ever thought about actually being on the school board. My wife said that's where you should be. In order to be a school board member and to be an effective school board member, I've looked through some of the budgeting process, you know, the line items. You really need to know the internal parts of all those line items as to how the money is used, like you were saying, and how it's spent and where in order to Try to create a better budget. Yep. Um, to know where you can make changes that doesn't maybe impact or does impact the quality of the education that we're getting. That's a difficult task. I don't believe probably there's too many people on the board that have done that or have had the opportunity to dive into all those right. line items. Um, the other thing that you touched on that was. You know, that I think people are not maybe necessarily aware of this inflation thing. The fact that we have done what we've done in the last year, year and a half with all this printed money has basically watered down the value of the dollar to the point where it's creating this inflationary effect. Um, and I think the impact to people who are either on the cusp of retiring or have retired with certain nest egg are now looking at a nest egg that's worth a large percentage less than what it was due to the cost increases of everything. Um, and I kind of wonder, you know, I've been reading articles about different things. Lumber prices aren't going back to where they were. They'll, you'll never see that again. Uh, the increases are somewhat here to stay, I think, as supply is burned up. Um, you'll see the prices come down a little bit. But you know, you're going to be faced, whoever is on that board is going to be faced with whatever bond or is put forward. Is this going to work for the cost that's right? But I honestly believe there should be checks and balances too. So if you're, if, if the communities together are, are hooking together a $40 million bond, I don't know about anybody else, but I really like to know where my money's going. And if we have to have a secondary auditing system to make sure that we have this money going somewhere, we have funneled where it needs to be, and not not spending it, you know, hastily because we asked for it and we're going to look like fools if we don't spend it, you know, or we can't ask for more than next year. I lived that world before when I worked for an agency, and I don't want to live that world anymore. So the checks and balances figures, I, I get it, I understand, but like I said, that's where that two to five year plan comes in. That's where we need to we need to trust our school system to make sure that they have those checks and balances in place to where the money that we ask for that we say this is what we need to be able to operate for this one year basis, okay, then that money is allocated the way it needs to be done. A COVID year, you know, I'm, I just gave you the example of the 300% sheet of funding. I mean, you want to put a whole building up at 300%. I mean, it's it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna tank you. You know, forty million dollars isn't even going to build you half the building that you want to build at seven million dollars. And whether it's seven million or three million, it's still not the year to do it because everything is so inflated that that money that we're asking the taxpayers for, that really probably don't even have the money to be able to to sustain what they have, with the rate of inflation on top of it. How do how do we figure it out? So I'm I'm me personally, I'm looking at trying to bring positive ideas to the table. I'm trying to get information from the community to be that liaison to say, hey, I had a conversation at, who knows, that shot. So that's for 45 minutes. Well, believe it or not, 45 minutes, if you put your hourly rate on it, you spend a lot of time in volunteer. <laughs> you guys sit in here every day for hours. 
you research for hours, um, you try to do the best for everybody at any given time, and you have a criticism every time you do it. So hats off to every one of you for taking the time to do that because some of them just vote you in because they don't want to do it. They just want to complain. So when you get six people in a room who really, really, really are doing their due diligence to do what they can, I applaud every single one of you. Same thing with the school board. I didn't see a salary line on what they were going to pay us to do this. I understand that the, what the reap and the benefits is, is a better community, a better education system, and trying to make it affordable for everybody that's here and make it more appealing for other things to come in. Our businesses, you know, um, our backgrounds, our heritages, um, new, new people coming in. I mean, that's that's what this is all about. So if we build a community. Yeah. And if we can build a community on education, then that's the best one because those are your leaders in the future. All right, we got to wrap it up yeah. just because we need a chat too. But thank you very yeah, much. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, go ahead. Any other, I mean, uh, we might have gone a little long on Scott. Any, any of the other candidates want a minute or two follow up? Glenn? Yeah, sorry if I just, great. Thanks, Mark. So, yeah, uh, real quick, two minutes. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to everybody there. Um, at first, I thought 10 minutes was allocated for each of us to talk, and then there'd be a question session. So my apologies. Oh, okay. um, second, secondly, I just wanted to compliment you know, the candidates. Yeah, let me just try to do this. Can you hear me okay? Better. Can you, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, can just try to speak loudly. Maybe it's just the volume of our speaker that we have. Sorry. All right. Well, so long story short, I just wanted to compliment everybody there and say thank you to the candidates for also sharing just as a Waterbury member, you know, I think that's, I think we're going to be in good hands no matter what. Um, but long story short, I just want to ask about if anybody knows before uh, this board, the school board meeting, what was the outcome of the weighted percentage of Waterbury's vote on the board? And I mean, I followed it a little bit, but does the select board have any thoughts on that specific issue? And that's pretty much it. Thank you guys. From the last time I knew it was the Valley actually had to be one percent, and you had forty-nine percent. But that was a couple of years ago. So don't quote me. Okay. So the weighted percentage. So the weighted percentage of all the candidates together, the valley and more generally, at fifty-one percent, and one very high forty-nine. So there's a lot of controversy about which side of the mountain range and what. All right. Thank well, you, I definitely look forward to learning more about. It. Thank you, guys. Yep. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, Thank Scott. Um, do we? I don't know. So basically, I think tonight we have to make a decision on whether or not we. Yeah, you can deliberate. I mean, okay. you've got a training. You can after the training is done. If you want to talk about it, you can do that. Okay. That's all right. Can we do that? I think that'd be good. We can't just put all three people on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Idea. They all, we might have a table. They, they all have very have good answers. Each one in different ways. Yeah. And everyone's again aware of the process. We recommend. Yes. Yep. Right. It's still the school board's ultimate decision. Yeah. I, I would just like to thank Tom Drake, who's the principal at Crossroad Book, for coming and attending and listening to these candidates, too. It's, it's important to you. So thank yeah. you Thanks for, for taking the time. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Yeah, we're going to a yeah. private session. <laughs> yeah. thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. I have a lighting recorder. Can I get out of here? Yep, you can get out of Just tell them that you're going to go out. So. so we're heading out. Yeah, we're going to deliver right after this thing. So I'm, just, I'm leaving Zoom. And you're leaving Zoom. We're all in. We're all in.